Our scripture reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew. And as we start in on our new message series, looking at the limits of God's grace, this is one of the, the scripture verses our script, sections of scripture, scriptures that came to mind, and it, was, it talks about a parable that Jesus tells Peter, who comes up to him and asks him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times. And we have to remember that this seven times is a good number. And in the Bible, you see seven a great deal. It is seen as a holy number, as a perfect number. And, Peter th- and it seems that Peter is saying this. I can't go wrong with saying seven. It's more than one. It's more than two. I should be in good stead if I say seven times. And then Jesus responds to him. And I'm thinking that Jesus probably gave him a little bit of a smile. I do not say to you seven times. But 77 times, or 7 times 7, either way, it's a lot more than 7. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. Let's just say those 10,000 in current terms would be an example of billions. This one, one servant owed as much as many countries or states or provinces do. We might question the wisdom of the king who gave out this much money to this one person. But that is not for this time. And since he could not pay, his master or king ordered him to be sold and his wife and children and all that he had and payment be made and realizing that all the money realized from the sale of himself, of his wife and his children and all of his property would be a mere fraction of what he owed. So the servant fell on his knees imploring, begging him, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, The master of the servant released him and forgave him the debt. Forgave him the debt. He did not say, you have some more time. Do your best to repay me when you can. We'll set up a payment plan. I'll be garnishing your wages. He forgave the debt. The debt was no more. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. In the children's story, I said about five bucks, maybe about 50. And seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, Pay me what you owe me. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me and I will pay you. Almost saying the exact same thing as the first servant. The first servant refused and went and put him in prison until he should repay the debt. When the fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant! I forgave you all the debt because you pleaded with me. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly Father will do to you, to every one of you, if you do not forgive your brother from your heart.
We are starting a new message series called The Limits of God's Grace. And it's something that's been really going through my heart, my mind for the last number of months is that God's grace, we talk about God's grace a great deal and sometimes we use the word grace more often than we really know its full meaning. And yet when we have an idea of what the grace is, sometimes we put it in a box and we leave it there. And in the box, we don't let God's grace expand, and yet God's grace is to grow. And when we think about what God's grace is, how often we sometimes fall short of what it really is, and we limit God's grace. Sometimes, and in our world today, we keep it in our understanding, and yet we don't look to the full meaning of what God's grace is from his word. And today we are starting this message series looking at the outer limits of God's grace. And from, from the outset, we really need to understand what grace means. What is grace? We can look to the Webster's Dictionary, and it says, a pleasing quality. When we hear someone say, that was a graceful dance. That was a graceful speech. Favor or goodwill, you showed grace. Gratitude or thanks. And yet, that doesn't really sum up all of what it means to have God's grace, what God's grace is. Some definitions of God's grace is receiving the blessing that you don't deserve. When we think about sin, the Bible tells us that the wages of sin is death, and yet God, through Jesus Christ, offers us new life and forgiveness. So we receive a gift that we don't deserve. Sometimes, looking at God's grace and we look at what Jesus does, sometimes Jesus is gracious and doesn't give us what we think we want. Because in the end, if we got what we want, it would have caused us more pain, more suffering. In some instances, this is very true. There is another deeper definition of grace that I'll read to you, and it's a little bit longer, and I will summarize it afterwards. It is from a commentary of Holy, on, called from Holy Scriptures on the book of Ephesians. And it says this, this grace, God's condescending love, God coming down in Christ Jesus, is the ground and the goal of all human effort directed towards salvation. From grace, there is first brought about in the heart of the Christian peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The reconciliation bringing us back together, which drives away the unrest caused by the re-echo of our conscience of the accusing and condemning law, making real rest of the soul. We're not at war with God. We're not at war with God because of God's grace, because of God's love. We have peace with God through Christ. Then in and by the side of peace toward God, there enters love toward our neighbor, both peace and love. In the convoy of faith which casts itself upon Christ as Lord, the objective grace works subjectively through faith and peace and love, unfolding and molding the strength and beauty of the human character in every department of life. So in other words, grace and love and peace are tied together and Many times we forget about all the, all the interconnections of these great words, of these great concepts, of these great things that we celebrate, that we invite into our lives, that we look for, that we hope converge in our lives, that we receive God's grace through Jesus Christ, that we receive God's love and God's peace. But this goes a lot deeper than just receiving. And sometimes we have, to be, we have to realize that we know about grace, we know about love, we know about peace. But we haven't received it. The 
We haven't taken it in. We haven't allowed God's grace, God's love, God's peace to truly work in us. We don't even really believe in God's grace, in God's love, in God's peace. It is just a concept. Sounds nice, but is it really for me? Is it really something that I can be part of? Is it really something that God has done for me? Maybe for you, because you're good. Maybe for you, because you've got it all together. But if you only knew, limits of God's grace. The parable we just read about the unforgiving servant. It starts off with a servant asking for grace. Asking, really asking for more time to be able to pay back debt. He really couldn't. There's no possible way. The money was long gone. The point of the scripture is that there was no way that this servant could pay back the debt. The carryover from that is that there's no way we can pay God back our sin debt. He asked for more time. And what does the king or the master say? The the king gives him the grace he asked for and forgives the outlandish debt. He goes actually beyond what the servant asked for. He forgives the debt completely. It is gone. It is forgiven. It is no more. He doesn't have to work to pay it off. It is completely gone. The king shows grace. The king gives him a gift of grace. But it's not just a gift. Too often, we think it is just a gift. We receive a gift. It's ours. We can do with what we please. It's kind of like someone gives you the keys to a new car. If you don't take the, car, the, the keys to the car, you haven't received the gift. It's just sitting there. You can't do anything with the car without the keys. But if you just take the keys and you never drive the car, you haven't experienced the fullness of the gift. The gift of God's grace is an invitation to change. It is an invitation to change how we see each other, how we see our lives, how we see God himself. It's a gift that takes away the warring, the sin, the things that keep us apart. It says there is peace, there is love here. Let's start over again. If we go back to the book of Genesis, where Adam and Eve are in this wonderful garden and God is walking with them. There is a close relationship together. That grace that God gives, forgiving the debt of the servant, taking away what was between them so they wouldn't have to live in fear. The servant wouldn't have to live in fear of what was coming. It's not about checking the boxes that we have. If I do this right, 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 then God will love me. Then I will be acceptable. Then I will be able to receive God's grace. The problem is, when are we ever there? Have you ever noticed we can say, I will be happy when... I will be happy when I'm done elementary school. So for the rest of your life, you should be happy. I will be happy when I'm done high school. For the rest of your life, you should be happy. I will be happy when I'm done college or university or have 
a job that's paying me lots and lots of money. I will be happy. I will be happy married and have children. I will be happy when I get to go on the trip that I've always wanted to go on. I will be happy when. Have you ever noticed that we keep changing the when? Sure, we're happy for a little bit when we've accomplished these things. But have you ever noticed that there's some days when we have all these things that we're just not that happy, that we're downright grumpy and a pain in the neck to be with? Okay, so that's me. That may not be you. See, it's not about what we can do. It is about what Jesus is doing for us, has already done for us, and will continue to do because of his grace, because of his love, because of the peace that he is granting us. But we have to allow Jesus to be at work in us. We have to receive the gift of grace. And allow Jesus' love to transform how we live, how we see this world, how we see those around us, how we even see ourselves. Does the, servant, does the first servant change? Of course he does. He goes from being afraid of the king and begging for mercy, and then he goes and he's angry. He had the other servant, another fellow servant, they're equals. He has received grace from the king, and now he is throwing an equal into jail because of a small debt, even though they both begged for mercy. He did not show the same grace that was shown to him. He didn't even show a fraction of the same grace. The king, the master, never laid a hand on him, and this passage says that he was starting to choke the servant. Give me back my money. He was using fear. He was trying to use his strength. He was trying to use everything in his advantage to get his money back, and the other servant couldn't pay. So he threw him in jail. We prayed the Lord's Prayer this morning. Forgive me my debts as I forgive my debtors. We like the first part of that. Because the first part's all about God. God, forgive me my debts. And chances are, some of us haven't even been paying attention to what our debts are. We know that they're there, and we know that God can forgive them through Jesus Christ. And we say it. But then there's this other thing. It's called, ah, it's, there's a simile there. Forgive my debts as I forgive my debtors. So forgive me the same way that I forgive those who have sinned against me, who have trespassed against me, who owe me. Forgive me like I forgive them. How many of us miss that one? The king sets out how to be gracious. The king shows the first servant the limits of his grace. There is this huge debt that has been forgiven. There wasn't a payment plan. There wasn't an if, and, or but. He forgave the debt and let the servant go free. Free of anything. And that grace that the servant was shown by the king did not change him. He did not allow that grace to change him. He did not learn his lesson. He still had fear. He still had fear that this grace was going to disappear. In reality, he condemned himself. The first servant went back to his own way of being judged and judging others. And in so doing, condemned himself. That he got the same punishment that he gave to his fellow servant. Instead of showing that same grace and sharing the blessing that had been given to him, he kept it for himself and wanted to get ahead. 
We sometimes miss the limits of God's grace because we set our own limits, and we'll be talking about those next week. Have we ever fallen into this trap, thinking you have received Jesus' grace, but haven't shared his grace with others? Because we're living in fear that one day God's grace will leave us. In so doing, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. We live, we have the opportunity to live as people changed and transformed by grace. Or we have the opportunity to live as people in fear of God's law and condemnation. Do we live in God's peace, with God's love? Or are we still at war with God, even though he's not at war with us? Jesus' grace is about love and peace that changes how we relate to him and with each other. It can be easy to hold on to a grudge, to all hold on to the hurt and pain, to keep storing up more hurt and pain. It's like carrying around a school bag. You've got your math textbook, your physics textbook, your biology textbook, your history textbook. You've got this hurt. You've got this pain. You've got the thing that this friend did. You've got the thing that this stranger did. You're carrying it all around and it's weighing you down. And it hurts. Or we can learn to forgive and be forgiven. To learn to love and be loved. To learn to live in peace with God and with each other. This is a gift that we have to share with others. It's not a gift that we put on a shelf. It's not a gift that we hold just in our hearts. It is a gift that is to overflow. It is a gift to be shared with our friends, our families, with strangers, with neighbors, with co-workers, with fellow students, even with teachers, people at the Tim Hortons drive-thru, Even with the neighbors that bug you. Remember, it's not too late. We're not too far gone. There is hope. Too often we can get in our heads that we'll just think about it. But I want us to think about who we will share this hope with. Who we'll share this grace with. Who we will demonstrate how gracious Jesus is by being gracious that we don't just keep it up here, that we actually put it into action. See, by doing this, we are showing people the power of Jesus' grace, how powerful this grace really is. It's not just a concept. It's not just a word. It's not just something we say at dinner or at breakfast or at lunch. But it's something that is real, that is transforming us and this world. Who will you show grace to? How will you live a life of grace today? There is a story I found on the internet. It's called, Because I'm Yours, the little girl who finally went to Disney World. And the writer tells us the story. I never dreamed that taking a child to Disney World would be so difficult. I thought about all the difficulties I would have about taking someone to, dif- to Disney World, the expense, the travel time, and I've learned over the past summer that having an empty Tim Hortons cup in the, cu- in the car is a good thing. Because some people get car sick. But those are far from what the writer is talking about. Or that such a trip could teach me so much about God's grace. Our middle daughter had been previously adopted to another family. I, Timothy, am sure this couple had the best of intentions, but they never quite integrated the adopted child into their family of biological children. After a couple of rough years, they dissolved the adoption, and we ended up welcoming an eight-year-old girl into our home. For one reason or another, whenever our daughter's previous family vacationed at Disney World, they took their biological children with them but they left their adopted daughter with a family friend, usually 
at least in the child's mind. This happened because she did something wrong that precluded her presence on the trip. And so by the time we adopted our daughter, she had seen many pictures of Disney World and she had heard about the rides and the characters and the parades. But when it came to passing through the gates of the Magic Kingdom, she had always been the one left on the outside. Once I found out about this history, I made plans to take her to Disney World. The next time a speaking engagement took our family to the southeastern United States. I thought I had mastered the Disney World drill. I knew from previous experiences that the prospect of seeing cast members in freakishly, freakishly oversized mouse and duck costumes somehow turns children into squirming bundles of emotional instability. What I didn't expect was that the prospect of visiting the dream world would produce a stream of downright devilish behavior in our newest daughter. In the month leading up to our trip to the Magic Kingdom, she stole food when a simple request would have gained her a snack. She lied when it would have been easier to tell the truth. She whispered insults that were carefully crafted to hurt her older sister as deeply as possible. And as the days on the calendar moved closer to the trip, her mutinies multiplied. A couple of days before our family headed to Florida, I pulled our daughter into my lap to talk through her latest escapade. I know what you're going to do, she stated flatly. You're not going to take me to Disney World, are you? The thought hadn't actually crossed my mind, but her downward spiral suddenly started to make sense. She knew she couldn't earn her way into the Magic Kingdom. She had tried and failed that test several times before. So she was living in a way that placed her as far as possible from the most magical place on earth. In retrospect, I'm embarrassed to admit that in that moment I was tempted to turn her fear into my own advantage. The easiest response would have been, if you don't start behaving better, you're right, we won't take you. But by God's grace, I didn't. Instead, I asked her, is this trip something we're doing as a family? She nodded, brown eyes, wide and tear-rimmed. Are you part of this family? She nodded again. Then you're going with us. Sure, there may be some consequences to help you remember what's right and what's wrong. But you're part of our family, and we're not leaving you behind. I'd like to say that her behavior grew better after that moment. They, di they didn't. Her choices pretty much spiraled out of control at every hotel and rest stop all the way to Lake Buena Vista. Still, we headed to Disney World. On the day we had promised, it was a typical Disney day. Overpriced tickets, overpriced meals, and lots of lines, mingled with just enough manufactured magic to consider maybe going again someday. In our hotel room that evening, a very different child emerged. She was exhausted, pensive, and a little weepy at times. But her month-long facade of rebellion had faded. When bedtime rolled around, I prayed with her, held her, and asked, So how was your first day at Disney World? She closed her eyes and snuggled down into her stuffed unicorn. After a few moments, she opened her eyes ever so slightly. Daddy, she said, I finally got to go to Disney World, but it wasn't because I was good. It's because I'm yours. It wasn't because I was good. It's because I'm yours. That's the message of outrageous grace. Grace, love, and peace. This is the story of all of us. Whether our rebellion against God has been great or small, whether we have lied to God when we could have told the truth, whether we have taken what we shouldn't have taken, whether we have done what we shouldn't have done, it is not by our accomplishments, it is not by our, about what we could do, it's about what Jesus has done and is continuing to do for each of us. No matter where we're from, no matter our background or who we are.
is about God's grace, which is bigger than we give him credit for. It is bigger sometimes than we allow him to be. He is gracious to us. May we be gracious to others. Let us pray. Lord, many times it is easier to hold a grudge. Many times it is easier to believe that we're not worthy. Many times it is easier to do things that would make your head turn. And I'm sure you wonder why. And yet you are still gracious to us. You still invite us into this wonderful relationship that forgives us, that calls us into a fullness of life that we can only imagine, that invites us to be in a relationship that is surrounded by love and peace and grace and forgiveness and mercy and hope. And you invite us to be people of grace. Even though it is hard in this world, because of all the things that are happening around us, all the things that have happened to us, all the things that we have done, we sometimes think that it's not possible, and yet you've shown that it is possible through Jesus Christ. You haven't completely wiped us out, forgotten about us. You've come to us in Jesus Christ. You've shown what it can be like to love your neighbor as yourself, to love God with all of your heart, mind, body, and soul, to do things that we see or see as impossible, but we know that is not impossible because you are with us. Help us to live lives that is trusting in you, not in fear of you. Help us to know how the, your grace transforms us and prepares us. And help us to forgive as you have forgiven us. It's hard. And at times it takes a great deal of time to get to that place. I'm thankful that you're patient. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.